Okay, with this presentation we're going to discuss the early rise of Islam. Uh, some overall questions to consider for this presentation. How does the rise of Islam fit into the historical framework? What else is going on, basically, in the world that is going to allow for the rapid expansion of this new faith? Also, what conditions exist in the Arabian Peninsula at the onset of the rise of Islam? What does the Arabian Peninsula look like and the conditions that exist there um, when this religion first starts? So with these next two slides, let's tackle that first overall question. What you've got is, if you look at this starting at the bottom here, 313, Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, and the capital is moved to Byzantium, Constantinople. We see this shift to the east with the old Roman Empire before it falls. So by the time we get to about 350, the Huns invade Europe. They're pushing the migrations of Germanic tribes into the heart of the Western Roman Empire, once again, help triggering this rise of the east. 392, Emperor Theodosius, remember he makes Christianity the official religion, ultimately this does not help save the Roman Empire, as in 410 Rome is sacked by largely Germanic invaders. Now, right around this time frame, we get Attila and the Huns at the height of their power in Eastern Europe. By this point, fast forwarding a little bit, we have no more Roman emperors, and we see, like we talked about with the Byzantine Empire, that papal power, that doctrine of patron succession. You get uh, people like Pope Leo I, who is greatly expanding uh, the power and influence of the Bishop of Rome. You have later on Gregory the Great, who's really solidifying it as not just a religious position, but also a political and economic one as well. And, with the conversion of Clovis uh, and the Frankish um, groups, you see this close relationship between the Western Church and the Franks develop. Um, the Franks are going to be a large um, Catholic kingdom. Meanwhile, in the East, 527 to 565, you get the reign of Justinian. Remember, this is the height of his power. Uh, you have the Nika Revolt, which ultimately he puts down. You get the building of the Grand Cathedral, the Hagia Sophia, in the capital of Constantinople. But ultimately, as well, you also see the eventual decline of the Byzantines begin because of the economic situations that develop due to, due to Justinian's reign. Right here. 565, the end of Justinian's reign. As the Byzantines are declining, we see five years later, as far as we can tell, the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, the founder of this Islamic faith. Everybody seems to focus so much of their attention because Justinian reconquers the West that um, this, there is this eventual shrinking of the Byzantine Empire in the West, which is true. Nobody is debating that. But there is also less power and influence in the East with the Byzantine Empire as well. At the same time, coming out of the Arabian Peninsula, you start to see the rise of Islam. About 600, you have Gregory the Great, who was going to solidify um, Western Europe as being predominantly Catholic. Now, we are going to see, later on in another presentation, Islam and like I said, it's important. The Franks uh, come to head as far as um, dominance in Western Europe as well. But we do see at this early onset sort of the rise of Islam out of that Arabian Peninsula and really challenging uh, the Byzantine Empire multiple times, um, as well as spreading through North Africa, which of course at one time was part of the Eastern Roman Empire, hence the Byzantine Empire. Uh, places like the Middle East, um, Damascus, Syria is a very important city. Uh, they go into Egypt and spread all across North Africa, which you can still see Islam today. Going to our next timeline here in the slide down, uh, 632 you have the death of the Prophet Muhammad, and then you have the Quran, the holy book um, which is compiled and sort of set as far as what is going to make up the Quran, and copies are now in heavy circulation throughout much of uh, the region of uh, where Islam 
is dominant. After this, you have, remember, the period of iconoclasm, which was started by Byzantine Emperor Leo III, who had been in Asia Minor, he had spent time there, and, in, and had been in contact with Islam. Uh, of course, in the Islamic faith, you are not to ever show or depict the prophet Muhammad. That is considered um, against the religion. And, of course, you see a similar idea coming up in the iconoclasm, where you do not depict uh, saints or Jesus or Mary. Uh, like I said in the West, as Islam makes its rapid expansion across North Africa, as we will see, you have the leader of the Franks, Charles Martel, who's going to defeat the Islamic Moors at the Battle of Tours. Tours is in France, and what you end up seeing is Islam is going to spread across North Africa and also into modern-day Spain. It is really the Franks who are able to halt the spread of these Islamic empires. If Charles Martel is unsuccessful, uh, we may be seeing a different dominant religion in Europe and in much of the Western world today as a result. Near the end of the iconoclasm period in the Byzantine Empire, you see uh, with Islam the rise of independent caliphates. Um, the caliphs, the singular version of that word, are the leaders um, in the Islamic faith. And after the death of Muhammad, there is great debate amongst um, the Islamic empires who is supposed to be the leader of this religion ultimately resulting in several different dynasties, which we will talk about in later presentations. Right after that, we see Oleg's reign and the rise of a unified Russian state and the later conversion of Vladimir with his political marriage to uh, the Byzantine princess Anna. And by about 1054, we get the official sort of great schism between the East and the West, where they are definitely, it's been leading up to it for a very long time, but we definitely see different um, religions develop in the Christian world between Greek Orthodox in the East and Roman Catholic in the West. The Byzantine Empire continues to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Remember, we call them almost in class the Incredible Shrinking Empire. And by 1071, in Manzikert, he is, if you remember, when we talked about in class, the emperor for the Byzantines is captured by uh, Turkish Islamic invaders. So as you can see, I mean, we talked about a lot with these with these timelines. We're going to talk about more in depth of them in, pre in future presentations and also in class. But you can sort of start to see the framework for which Islam rises. Greek Orthodox is being challenged in the East. The Byzantine Empire is not right away, but it is eventually going to collapse, and you see a new, strong, independent religion develop in the Arabian Peninsula, and then start to expand and rapidly expand. That is one of the keys to understanding Islam and its expansion. It was, in many respects, a very rapid, almost like, if you'll call it today, almost like an overnight sensation or something. Um, took a little longer than that, obviously, but still, there was a rapid expansion of Islam. So let's take a look at where it started. The physical geography of the Arabian Peninsula, the birthplace of Islam. As you can see here with a satellite photo, you do not have a whole lot of vegetation. This is not going to be a river valley civilization. This is going to be a largely um, desert area with a few oases, these little pockets of vegetation. Um, what you see is mostly nomadic herders in this region. If you look at a modern map of it today, largely makes up the country of Saudi Arabia. The two mo most important holy cities for, I should probably say three, but the two most important holy cities as far as the early um, rise of Islam are Mecca, right here, and Medina. Later on, of course, um, with the Prophet Muhammad, which we'll talk about with beliefs, just like it's important to Judaism, and just like it's important to Christianity, um, the city of Jerusalem is going to be extremely important in the Islamic faith as well. So, about 600 AD, when Islam is getting its start. We had already seen the development of the Arabic language. <clears throat> now, these are various different groups. Okay, It was not a united 
um, just one signal ethnic group with a one single history or heritage. But you did start to see the importance of the Arabic language. Now, they're largely comprised of what we call Bedouin groups. They are um, pastoral nomads in various tribes. It's important to understand um, Saudi Arabia. It's right next to major trade routes. And we're not just talking about local trade routes, which they obviously had. But we're talking about major continental trade routes. They're not really part of them. They're in close proximity to them but they're not directly part of them, per se. This is going to have two very significant impacts that you need to understand as far as where Arabia is, and really going back to that whole geography idea. First off, like we said, it's not a river valley civilization. It's not right at the center of trade like, say, a city like Constantinople was. As a result, the Arabian Peninsula is going to be able to develop without necessarily being conquered by outside forces. We haven't really talked a lot about the Arabian Peninsula up to this point in the year. They were never part of a Greek colony. They were never um, dominated by the Roman Empire. Um, they were never even um, completely taken over by Persia either. If we go back to ancient Persia. That's very significant and that's very important. They never had to completely adopt somebody else's ideas or culture or ideas on society and government. They were exposed to them, but they weren't necessarily um, forced into accepting them. As a result, you never see a large kingdom develop in, in uh, the Arabian Peninsula up to this point. Uh, most of these tribes fought with each other. They were based on loyalty, family loyalty, extended family loyalty, warfare, and vendettas. Uh, the idea that, you know, this almost constant warfare between these tribes. We see a tradition of oral storytelling, and you're also going to see this reflected in what the Quran is, the holy text of Islam. Largely, they were polytheistic. They did worship idols, which are going to be two no-nos, of course, for the Islamic faith once it develops. A few tribes, however, because even though they're not conquered by anybody, they're still near enough to an... Uh, enough of different people that they were exposed to the Judaic uh, tradition, Christianity, and even Zoroastrianism. Many people simply referred to themselves in Arabia as, um, or they viewed outsiders, I should say, excuse me, as people of the book, people of Abraham. Uh, they were followers, then, and the Islamic faith acknowledges people like Abraham and Moses and Jesus. Jesus isn't the son of God, but he still is a prophet. Now, I want to briefly introduce the most important city in, in the Islamic faith, and that is Mecca. It was a trading destination. It might not have been on the same scale as Constantinople or, say, maybe ancient Athens, but it was still a trading destination. There was still a mix of ideas. It was very cosmopolitan. Lots of different people in this one area. Lots of different religious ideas. At the center of Mecca, you have the Kaaba. It is a small temple that was reportedly founded by Abraham. Once again, showing these connections to this uh, Judaic tradition. It was a pilgrimage site. Even today, it's an extremely important pilgrimage site for Islam. But even before Islam got its start, the Kaaba, as you can see pictured over here, was an extremely important site for pilgrimage. Of course, because it's a trade city, you're, you're going to see a lot of economic inequities as this city develops. Now, this is going to have some, some impacts on the Prophet Muhammad himself, um, in which he's going to see this. And one of the overriding principles in the Islamic faith is equality, um, where it doesn't matter um, your hierarchy or your social standing. Okay? So that's the first presentation. Uh, remember those two overriding questions, be able to answer them. Move on to part two and when we talk about the Prophet Muhammad. Thanks for listening. Later.